The centurion man, this soldier, demonstrates a type of faith that was unheard of really in that day and time. In this lesson entitled, Faith of a Centurion, we're going to see what type of faith he has. My question is, do we have that same type of faith? Ladies and gentlemen, there are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description and in the comment section below. Click the link, get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. But I hurry, because the International Standard Sunday School is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence. Join Elder Rodney Jones with our Sunday School lesson. Building and equipping the children of God. Grab your Bibles, grab your notes. Get your lessons and get ready. Now let's go. Sunday school is now in session. Sunday school is now in session, says my two granddaughters, or two of my granddaughters, Bria and Amaya. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday school lesson. It's taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation and Only Ministries Church of God and Christ. And we're located 1700 West 87th Street right here in the city of Chicago. If this is your first time, please make sure that you leave me a comment in the comment section below. If this is your first time, I'd like to welcome you to Sunday School and thank you for studying with us even at this time. Make sure you also like, give me a thumbs up and like this particular lesson. And lastly, please make sure, please ma'am and sir, that you subscribe to this channel and click that bell notification. Make sure you click the word all so that YouTube will notify you, bink, Brother Jones just uploaded another lesson. We got a good in here on today. We're way behind schedule, so we're going to kind of pick up a little bit of our time. We got some challenges on this week, but God is still good, and he's still God. Today we're talking about the faith of or faith of the centurion. This particular soldier was faced and confronted with a certain type of challenge in his life. But this challenge that he had, I love the way he dealt with it. We're in Luke's Gospel, the seventh chapter, verses one through 10. Today's date is April 14th, 2024. Happy birthday to you. If it's your birthday, happy anniversary. Today is my fifth year pastoral anniversary, and I'm inviting everybody. I'll give you that announcement at the end. Let's begin to dig in and to see what the writer speaks about how he demonstrates to us the type of faith that this centurion had that every believer should have. We bless you for this day and for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. To the reading of a lesson, verses number one. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Rodney Jones Sunday School. Yes, that is the wrong topic right there. Don't even look at that. Look at <laughs> Oops. Look at this. It says, now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered in Capernaum. When he, he, when he, this is the timing. Remember, when you're studying, you want all details. Find all of the facts. The timing, the location, the people, uh, situations, commands. You're looking for all of that. So the timing of this right now is when, when, when he had ended or completed or when he had finished. So the question is, who was the he, the he, ladies and gentlemen, right now is Jesus. When he had, what is it that he completed or finished? He completed and or finished his sayings which means he had a series of sayings and he had a beginning and an end. So he did this in the audience. We're going to find out what that word is. In the audience of this, this people, that's when he left and entered into Capernaum. At that point, 
is when he entered into Capernaum. So he ended all of his statements. Now I have notes for this. These notes are the same notes that I did in 2019 when this lesson was introduced. I just made a little bit updates. So if you notice that the notes is not the norm, it is not. It is the original notes that I first did. Okay. So he ended all of his statements. In other words, he, he completed his discourse on the Mount because Jesus was on the Mount. This particular discourse, as we know it, is called the Beatitudes. And the Bible let us know that there was a great multitude of people that had followed him from all over. After seeing this great multitude, he changes his position. He goes up onto a mountain, the Bible says, and began to teach them there. He had recently called his disciples right before all of this took place in the sixth chapter of the book of Luke in the 14th verse. And he called them after praying all night. He appointed those as his apostles. Then he came down from there according to Luke 6 and 17, and he began to stand on a plain. And the multitude came to Jesus at that time for two purposes, one to hear him and another to be healed. Luke chapter 6, verses number 17. And it is by this time that the multitude came to touch him so that they can be healed. And this is when uh, Jesus began uh, what's called the B attitude, let me adjust this note right there, uh, and or, or he spake a parable. I, I, well, two things. He, he did his, the B attitudes, and when he finished the B attitudes, then he began to speak parables. That's chapter 5 and 39. So the writer says the sayings, the sayings would probably be both the B attitudes or the attitude that someone else one should be in and uh, his parables he said that he spoke this in the audience of the people the word audience means to hear it is the faculty of hearing or the word ear so he spoke all of this in the hearing or in the ear of the people he spoke it publicly now the people here according to luke 6 17 through 19 would be the company of his disciples it would be the great multitude of people from all Judea, from Jerusalem, and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. And they all came to hear him, which would also include his apostles. The Bible lets us know that he entered into Capernaum, which is a mixture of words, meaning a village of Nahum. It is a town. Capernaum is a town north on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, well, actually, Jesus had made his headquarters during his ministry in Galilee. You can find that in Matthews 4, 13, Matthews 9 and 1, and even Mark 2 and 1. So the importance of this city is further demonstrated by the location of a military installation there under the command of a centurion. This area apparently was so important that they had the presence of a military force because here is where you find the centurion. So it must have been a sizable town because the tax collector had his office there as well, Mark 2 and 14. A high officer of the king, Herod Antipas, he had his residence there and he built a synagogue for the people. So this apparently was a very important place. Capernaum, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, and a certain, a certain centurions, watch this, his servant. Sometimes they will call their servants their son because sometimes he was his natural son and sometimes he was close enough to him to be called his son. This man was dear unto the centurion. He was sick right here. And he was at the point to die. He was ready to die. Now, a centurion is a Roman soldier. And they were against the Jews. He would be a captain over 100, which is called a century. But he would actually command roughly 80 troops. Now, he was a Gentile. 
and there was not there. Um, let me see. Therefore, he was not a part of the Jewish religion. Now, he had a servant that was dear. The word dear means to be held in honor, precious, uh, even esteemable, esteemable to him. His servant, the Bible says, was sick with the palsy. That's Matthew 8 and 6. Not only was he sick with the palsy, but he was grievously tormented by it as well. Now, Jesus had just recently healed those with the palsy in Matthew 4 and 24. Now, when you look at Matthew 8 and 6 in the Living Translations, it says, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in parable, terrible pain. <laughs> In the Amplified Version, it says, and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house paralyzed and distressed with intense pain. He was a servant, which we know sometimes were permanent positions and sometimes were not. And there were different types of servants of that day and time. He said that he was ready to die. The word ready means to be about to or even at the point. So this centurion had a servant and the servant was very dear to him. And what's interesting to me is what he is getting ready to do, how he does it and the outcome of the whole matter. I love this guy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you really want to get your notes for this lesson, all you have to do is take your phone, turn it on camera, not on a movie, turn it on camera, and then touch, you'll see a yellow thing show up. Uh, touch that yellow words. It'll take you to where my notes are. And then type in the title of the lesson. And from there, then you will be able to download these notes. All right. Get back into it. Verses number three. Let's look at what he says. It says that when he heard. I, I, I love this right here, ladies and gentlemen. He heard of or about Jesus. When he heard about him, he sent. I, I love putting things together. He heard, he sent unto him. Look at who he sent. He sent the elders of the Jews, and they were beseeching, begging him that he would come and heal his servant. Let's get these he's. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him, Jesus, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him, Jesus, that he, Jesus, would come and heal his servant. The his is the centurion. The servant is sick with palsy and grievously tormented. Even he is in excruciating pain. And I love this because this man hears about Jesus. His servant was at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. Matthew 8 and 6. The centurion came unto him, beseeching him to heal him. Now, Matthew says that the centurion went. I need you to understand there's no discrepancy. According to the writers and even in the time, if I sent someone to you, that's equivalent of me coming to you myself. He heard of Jesus. Everything taking place in this lesson is going to be based on the fact that he heard about Jesus. No, the scripture didn't say he saw Jesus, but he heard about him. Because Jesus' fame had already gone out according to Luke 4 and 37. He heard of Jesus because the fame went out everywhere throughout that country in that region, Luke 4 and 37. When he heard, he acted. I need somebody to type. When he heard, he acted. He heard of Jesus. He heard about Jesus. He acted on what Jesus. He heard. Now we call this active faith. He didn't have that dead faith. He put his faith and his belief and his trust into action. 
This Gentile, he exercised what I believe wisdom and possibly discretion. Because the uniqueness about this is Jews are speaking to Jesus about a Gentile. Especially in that day and time. So the centurion, he exercised wisdom by sending Jews to meet a Jew concerning a Gentile. The discretion would be that the fact that a Jew was coming to the house of a Gentile. He sent elders of the Jews. These were probably the leaders of the community. These were men of the community and these were seasoned men. Here the word elder doesn't mean ordained. It means of age, men of wisdom. He sent them there beseeching, which means to request, to entreat, and even to beg. They were representatives. And these men come from a synagogue. According to history and custom, for every 10 men in a community, there would be built in that community a synagogue. And so these men came to Jesus, a Jew, to have him to heal a centurion, a Gentile's servant. Come on, somebody. Fly. And when, when, remember timing, when they came to Jesus, they besought him. That him is Jesus. They besought him, ladies and gentlemen, instantly, saying that he, which is the centurion. Uh oh. Not the servant. He was worthy for whom he should do this. Watch this. Because they are coming not for the servant. They're coming for the centurion. The centurion is sending them for the servant. They're telling Jesus that the centurion who sent us is worthy of this request. Yes. So the first thing the elders did was instantly beseech Jesus. They begged Jesus to come to do this because of the centurion. They told Jesus that the centurion was worthy of him coming and of him healing the servant. Jesus is taking note of the faith of the centurion. He who wants his servant to be healed badly. He has enough faith that if he send the people to Jesus, that his servant is going to be healed. That's a lot of faith. I wonder. How much faith do we have? Do we have that type of faith? Or do we only have the type of faith that when I come to church, when he lays hands on me, because often if I say, how many of you are in need of healing? You raise your hand. You're waiting on me to do a couple of steps. Step number one, call you up. Step number two, anoint you. Step number three, pray for you. Step number four, send you away. Step number five, then you'll be healed. This man will dismiss all of those steps. I said this on last week as we were concluding our service. The Lord moved so powerful until I wasn't able to preach last week. Praise God. I'm fine with that. Long as God moves when he's in the building, it's not about Rodney. It's about Jesus. And I said to them, it is not connected to your praise. Healing is not connected to my praise. That's an emotional thing. Healing is connected to my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. The only way to be healed is not through dancing and praising. The only way to be healed is faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. So the elders of the Jews focused on the centurion and said he's worthy. The centurion's focus is on the servant. <laughs> and the elders of the Jews says that the centurion is worthy, but the centurion is going to say he's not worthy, at least not to meet Jesus face to face or for him to come into this house. 
So when they got to Jesus, they besought him, which means to call to one side, to call for, or even to summons them. They besought him instantly, earnestly, hastily, and even with haste. They begin to beg. Amplified Version says they begged him earnestly. New Living Translation says, so they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, is what they said to, to Jesus. Verse number five, they begin to give a reason why. Says so the reason why is for or because. This is why we want you to come. He is the centurion. He loves our nation, ladies and gentlemen. That nation is the Jews of which Jesus is a Jew. He loves our nation and he, he, the centurion, built us a place to worship. So you've got to come and heal him. So the elders of the Jews give Jesus a twofold reason why. He should honor their request. He loves our nation, the nation of the Jews, and he has built us a synagogue, a place for us to come read the Torah, the prophets, the psalm, to worship, to take care of the business of the brotherhood. So in the eyes of these Jews, this man, man is worthy of the honor of Jesus performing this task. This Gentile is not like the other Roman soldiers. He cares for the people. He's, he not only loves our people, which means to esteem, uh, indicating a direction of the will and finding one's joy, but he built us a house of worship. Now watch this. God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you. Genesis 12 and 3. This man, the centurion, has blessed the Jews. Since he has blessed the nation, then God has to keep his word by blessing him. Come on now. Rather than force them to worship the idol gods, he built a place for them to worship. Synagogue, remember, is a place where there are 10 or more Jews. They would erect this particular thing. They would go there for and take care of their church matters. I love that. When the government builds you a house of worship. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent, notice what he sends. He sends friends to him saying unto him, Lord, look, notice what he called them. Trouble not thyself, for I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servants shall be healed. Let's look at this. Jesus hears the plea who was instantly begging uh, Jesus to come. Then when they finish this, Jesus goes with them. So this Jew prepares and begins to go in the direction of a Gentile's house to heal. Because I need the people of God to understand. When it comes to healing, everybody on earth has a right to be healed. That does not exclude non-believers. You will find many of the people in Jesus' days that he healed were not sanctified. Weren't saints. They wasn't Pentecostal. They wasn't missionary Baptist. They wasn't Church of God in Christ. They wasn't whatever your denomination is. But they were human. And every human being that's sick deserves to be healed by his creator and his maker. How dare us tell people that healing is the children's bread. And you're absolutely correct. But I need you to understand, please, ma'am and sir, that when Jesus said that, the children was not us. The children was the children of Israel, who he spoke to the woman of Syrophine, the Syrophoenician woman, who was not a Jew. I believe that's what she was. And when, when, when he was not far 
from the house. Look at what the, who the centurion sent then. The centurion is a wise brother. He sent friends. He didn't send now Jews. He sent his friends. Now, when Jesus gets close to the house, he sends a second group. And this group says unto Jesus, Lord, what do you call them? It's, it's an, a title and an honor, a, 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 a wording, a phrase of respect and honor. He says, Lord, don't trouble yourself. And the reason why, he says, because I'm not worthy. That you should enter under my roof. Neither am I worthy for me to even meet you face to face. But what I want and need you to do, because you got this authority, I need you to speak a word, and my servant, ladies and gentlemen, shall. Look at what he said. Speak a word. So after hearing this delegation of Jews, he decides to go with them, because healing is a part of the ministry of Jesus. He preached, he taught, and he healed, Matthew 4 and 23. The purpose of Jesus going with them is so that he can heal the servant. That's Matthew 8 and 7. Jesus is going to heal the servant at the request of the centurion, who is a Gentile, Luke 7 and 3. When he gets close to the house, the centurion sends his friends to stop Jesus. He calls him Lord, which is a title of expressive, uh, of honor, of expressive, of respect and even reverence. The word given to Jesus when they met him was trouble not. Trouble means don't bother yourself. Don't worry about entering. So the centurion, he sent two groups of representatives to Jesus. First group he sent were the elders of the synagogue. The second group he sent were his friends who were non jew both of which spoke about the character of the centurion. All of this is because the centurion wanted his servant to be healed. A centurion states two things is not worthy. Number one, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. Number two, I'm not worthy to go out there to meet you. And the word worthy means deserving, such as merits honor, or even having worth or excellence, worthy, having worth or excellence. I don't even have worthiness. I'm not even worthy. I'm not honorable and I don't even have enough merits. I don't even deserve. We approach Jesus like we deserve it. He stands under that Jesus just needs, or he understands that Jesus needs to do one thing. Don't enter but say a word. If you say a word, he says, my servant is going to be here. I'm going to be here for a little bit. So Jesus does not need to come to his house. Jesus can form a miracle right there, right where he's standing. And most of Jesus's miracles was performed by a touch. This one is going to be an unusual one, like a couple other ones, because he's not going to see the individual. He's going to speak the word. So the centurion says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. This demonstrates the humility of the centurion. He also shows his honor, his reverence, and his respect for Jesus. And this was a time when Jews and Gentiles didn't get along. This Gentile may have images of idol gods also in his house. And it would probably be a dishonor, a disrespect for the presence of Jesus to be in uh, this man's house. I love it. He may have had to clean some things out that was not worthy of in the presence of Jesus. So he says, just say a word. The centurion says something that speaks volume of his faith in Jesus. You're so powerful that you don't have to come home. You're so powerful that you don't even have to see my servant. You're so powerful that if you just open up your mouth and speak a word, it'll be done. I need somebody to understand that your word is powerful enough for you to be healed. 
The Bible said in Psalm 33 and 9 that God spoke and it was done. He said he commanded and it stood still. Jesus says in Mark 11 and 23, speak or say unto this mountain. Open up our mouth and begin to speak. The centurion teaches us, stop, please stop saying it's connected to your praise. Because you're only telling me I'm going to be healed at your command when you tell me to praise God. You wasn't there when I praised him in the car. You wasn't there when I praised him before I got in the car. You weren't there when I praised him in the parking lot. So if all of that didn't work, why is it all of a sudden now going to work now that I'm at church and you're getting ready to raise an offering? So you tell me it's connected to my praise because your next statement is going to be it's connected to your obedience. It's only connected to my faith in Jesus Christ. He says, if you have faith of a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be removed, and it shall be have taken place. Matthew 17 and 20. Uh, Philippians 4 and 6, he said, let your requests be made known unto God. So the centurion asked God in the word. He specifically made his request. To make your request means to be specific with, with God. Luke 4, 36 and 37 says, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they came out. Yet they were in the presence. Here, Jesus speaks something about someone he has not even laid eyes on. Verse number eight says, for I also am a man. Watch this. I am a man set under authority, number one. And then he says, having under me soldiers all i have to do is say unto them go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he do it now this man is putting some powerful stuff on the floor because not only does he recognize his own authority he recognizes the authority of jesus two very very major things he tells him you don't have to come to my house because I also am a man under set under authority, which means I am a representative of a greater power just like you are. He says, I have men under me that if I speak, they're going to do what I tell them to do. Now, this man could be saying that Jesus I understand you were sent here and set under authority, which means you have someone greater than you, which is your father. But then you have things under your authority, which is healing, which is life, which is strength, which is whatever. Because the same Jesus spoke to a dead man who had been dead four days and he came to the same Jesus spoke to a, a child who was dead and she rose. He says, so me and you got something in common. We both are men set under authority, which means someone is greater than us. And then we have people under us. Jesus didn't just have at his disposal the disciples and the apostles. He had the angels and he had everything and everybody else under his disposal. He says, all I have to do is speak it and it will take place. So he's telling Jesus, I need you to do the same thing. When Jesus heard, when he heard, now that's funny, the man heard of Jesus, and now Jesus heard uh, of the things that this man just said. He marveled at him and turned and said unto the people that were following him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not even in Israel. This man just demonstrated faith in its utmost, faith in its highest. He just put a type of faith on the floor that caused Jesus to marvel, which means to be in admiration. This man just sent Jesus in a direction that he can, without a shadow of a doubt, work on this man's behalf because this man shows us a type of faith that every believer should have. 
You don't have to move, Jesus. All you have to do is speak. And Jesus turned to that great multitude and said, I've not found this type of faith nowhere, not even in Israel. And this man is not a Jew. This man never confessed that I was the Christ. He never confessed that I was the son of God. This man doesn't uh, live this type of lifestyle, but this man understands who I am. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus spoke the word and the servant was healed that very hour. I need to say this to somebody. If you're sick, all you need to do is speak the word. What's the word? Father, I receive the healing of Jesus Christ into my body. Father, be glorified in my body through healing. Because Jesus said when he got ready to raise up Lazarus from the dead, he said, I'm going to do this that the son of God, son of man may be glorified in the father. So I need you to type healing brings glory to the father and the son. Type that. Healing brings glory to the Father and to the Son. So when we ask for God to heal us, we're asking him for his will. But healing takes place through faith. Either you have the faith or the person that's praying for you must have the faith. But faith must exist. You can shout and praise him all you want. But if you do not have faith to be healed, then uh, you won't be healed. Because healing, faith comes by faith healing. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, my anniversary today, if you were watching this on a Sunday, I'm inviting everyone to come and be my special guest, four o'clock. There it is right there. Those of you who want to sow into the ministry, there are ways right there that you can sow. If I have been a blessing to you, my good friend and brother, Pastor Staff is going to be the speaker. Lastly, I will be in Houston, Texas next weekend. Saturday, April 20th, I will be in Houston, Texas at the Meadowbrook. That Saturday, that Friday when I'll be flying in, me and my good friend uh, Just Teach Ministries, we are trying to find a place for us to meet. Maybe some of the saints could meet me there and we can have some fellowship and some food and have ourselves a ball. Lastly, if you want to support this ministry, there are ways right there that you can support this ministry. I appreciate you all. If you want to pause it, you can pause it, but I'm gonna go ahead and end this video. I got to go and bury my granddaughter's father. So pray for my family. Remember my motto, teaching the word of God and the spirit of excellence. And the motto of the other Sunday school is a child saved, is a soul saved plus a life. And if it be the Lord's will, if the creek don't rise, if the Lord delay is coming, and providing that I don't oversleep, I'll see you Sunday at nine or uh, eight o'clock a.m. for our live stream. Peace. Please subscribe to my granddad's channel. Thank you.